Hi everyone and thank you for taking the time to listen to our presentation. Today we will take you through the story of how we went from data to churn prediction in Tava2. Churn is a very important word in this presentation, so before we go on I just want to clarify that churn is the same as losing a customer. So when a customer churn, it typically ends its subscription or stops using a service. My name is uh, Silja and I work as a data scientist in TV2. Uh, I have worked here for almost two years now. And before I started in TV2, I worked as a consultant within data and analytics. And my name is Astre and I'm also a data scientist in TV2. I have worked here for almost three years and I was previously a developer in Know With Experience. TV2 is a media company based in Bergen and Oslo. It has eight different TV channels, a website for news and entertainment, and a streaming service called TV2 Play. Most of you probably know it as TV2 Sumo, but actually on this Monday we launched a complete rebranding of TV2, so TV2 Sumo is now called TV2 Play. TV2 Play has over half a million paying customers, and as any other subscription-based service, it is crucial to maintain a high customer experience so that we are able to keep our customer as long as possible. One way of doing this can be to target dissatisfied customers by, by calculating their churn probability. We can then try to get them to stay longer by doing some sort of preventative measures. In addition to churn probability, it is very important or even more important to understand why the customer might churn. This will help us to choose the correct churn prevention strategy. The last year we have been part of a machine learning project that tries to solve this churn prediction problem for the customer at TV2 Play. And today we will share the story with you guys. Uh, so a typical timeline for a machine learning project looks uh, somewhat like this. Uh, it usually starts with some business need or an idea for a machine learning model. And when the problem is defined and we know what we want to create a model for, a team of data scientists starts developing it by testing possible features, training and validating different models until they're happy with the result. When the model is done, uh, it's time to deploy it in a production environment. And you have probably heard this before, but uh, almost 90% of all machine learning models never make it to production. Uh, so this is a critical step in the process. Uh, since we won't be able to actually use the predictions uh, for whatever they are meant to be used for before the model is deployed and the predictions are made available. Uh, the last step, maybe the most important one, is to actually use the predictions to create business value. Uh, we experienced that uh, this was the most challenging step, uh, since it's not obvious to us exactly what actions we want to take given a customer's churn probability. Uh, so in this presentation, we will focus on uh, this whole process for our churn prediction model. Uh, we will tell you how we started working on this problem, how we got the model into production, and we will try to focus on uh, what we learned along the way in this process. We started out really ambitious with a cross-functional team with people from the commercial department working with customer relations and insight together with me and Celia as data scientists from the data and integration department. We tried to identify some business needs and realized that as a subscription service it would be valuable to have some sort of score telling us the happiness or engagement of a customer. This uh, score could then be used to target dissatisfied customers with high risk of churn to try to increase their experience of the service before they actually stop their subscription. If we could uh, do this, we would be able to decrease the overall churn rate of Tavo2 Play. So we ended up deciding that the churn prediction model would be valuable for Tavo2 and hopefully answer a lot of questions that the customer relation team had about why customers churn. We had a lot of workshops in the beginning and it was not always easy to get the common understanding of the problem. This photo was taken at our first workshop and as you can see we were pretty frustrated. 
I think uh, here we try to come up with a good definition of a churn customer in terms of data. But regardless of the long workshops and a lot of talking, it, is, it has been very important to include uh, the stakeholders early on in the project especially since they are the ones that will eventually use the predictions in the end. Uh, we needed business people engaged from a business standpoint and not just other data nerds like us excited about developing a new machine learning model, which, uh, which I think happens quite often. So after uh, going through the step of defining the business case, uh, we started to experiment with some real data. Uh, to create relevant features and build a machine learning model. Uh, in this phase, we developed everything locally using Python. Uh, we wrote a lot of code to extract, aggregate and transform uh, raw viewing and subscription data into features that could be used to train a model. Uh, and since we did everything locally, we had to sample data to be able to run the feature generation in reasonable time. Uh, and even though we only used sample data, uh, when adding a new feature, we typically had to run the code overnight, which made the development cycle really long. Um, in this development part of the process, uh, we of course iterated between creating new features, training a model and looking at feature importance and model performance metrics. When doing feature engineering, uh, we looked a lot at correlations between the suggested features and between each feature and churn. Uh, this helped us to choose important features quickly and to drop features that were highly correlated. Uh, we decided quite early to use Axkeboost as our machine learning model, uh, mainly because we have seen it been used and performed well on similar problems. Uh, so it was a natural place to start experimenting. We had a plan to try uh, different models at a later time, but we uh, never really got that far. Uh, for example, we wanted to try uh, recurrent neural networks because we believe that how the customer's viewing pattern changes over time is important when predicting churn. Uh, so it would be interesting to try a model well suited for time series data. But I think we were maybe too optimistic to think that we could uh, go back and redo the whole model uh, at a later time. Uh, if we wanted to do this, we should have probably just uh, done it from the start. Uh, but the, the actual model training was probably the part of the process we spent the least time on. Uh, we did some hyperparameter tuning, but most of our time in this development phase uh, was spent on data preparation and trying to understand the model. And uh, since we chose to use a, a complex model like uh, Axkeboost, uh, we needed some method to help us understand how the different features impacted each prediction. Uh, this was important when trying to improve the model in the next iteration, but mostly important to help us understand and communicate the results. Uh, we used something called SHAP values for this. Uh, SHAP values gives us a local explanation for each prediction, but it can also be used for global explanations, uh, such as feature importance as well. Uh, SHAP values tells us how much and in what direction each feature affected a single prediction. Uh, so we use this to explain how a specific customer got its prediction to the business stakeholders in our team. Uh, we try to involve them uh, in this development step as well to sort of get a common understanding of important features early on. Uh, but we ended up spending a lot of time on meetings and discussions uh, with very few conclusions. Uh, so in the end, me and Astrid were quite eager to get more technical and start on the deployment step. Now it was time to actually create something that we could use in production. This was by far the most time consuming phase of our machine learning project. In this phase, we didn't uh, collaborate as much with the business stakeholders as we had done earlier in the project. And we also added a data engineer to our team. This helped us to speed up the development process and to create a solid system with testing, centralized logging, 
is the deployment and so on. This is a very simplified illustration of our churn pipeline. It consists of mainly of three steps. First, we create features. Then we use these features to train a model, which is then used when predicting churn. Creating features is the most complex step. We use Apache Spark to do this because we knew from the previous stage that we had to shorten down the feature generation process. Another team in Teva2 had already experimented with some processing platforms and they had decided on using Spark. So Spark became the natural option for us as well. Spark is a platform for large scale data processing and makes it possible to run Python or PySpark in parallel. So this was perfect for our need. We create features for all customers once a day based on their subscription data and viewing history. And the features are created based on configuration files that look like this. In these configuration files, we include which features we want to create and how they should be aggregated. We also specify how we want to transform the feature, what we should do with empty values, and what values we should expect for each feature. For example, here you can see the Sum Playing Time mobile feature is made by summarizing the Playing Time SEC field where device category equals mobile phone. These configuration files makes it very easy for us to add new features or removing existing ones without changing any code in the application. Uh, so for model training, we use uh, Python instead of Spark jobs. Uh, and the Python job is running in Kubernetes. Uh, to start with, we only had to uh, run this job once to get the production version of the model we developed in the previous step, this time using all the data, not just the uh, sample data. Uh, we don't really need to we train a new model every day uh, when calculating the features and predictions uh, since we don't expect a big change in the model over time. Uh, but we soon realize that we often want to make small changes to our model and this will also be necessary to handle in the future. Uh, for example, if the features we use change or if the model performance decreases over time uh, such that we should update the model by training it on more recent data. Uh, so we ended up creating a quite generic code for training an XKBoost model, uh, which is configurable by the user when starting a model training job. Uh, so uh, this is an example of how the event we sent to start the training job looks like. Uh, it's just a dummy example. The values here are not the ones we ended up using in the final model. But you can see here that we are able to specify the date range we want to get training data for. And we do a train test split within this range. Uh, we can also specify exactly which features uh, should be used. And uh, we can also add uh, test features uh, not used by the model already in production uh, if we want to experiment with creating new models. Uh, we can also filter the data based on some condition if we want to. Uh, and we use this functionality now to build two separate models, uh, one for new customers and one for old customers. Uh, we also added functionality to do hyperparameter tuning as a part of the training process uh, where the best parameters are selected to train the final model. And we also store uh, all this uh, metadata about each model uh, we train, such that we can always recreate the model if we need to. Uh, we also have a Python job for making the predictions using the model currently in production. Uh, this runs every day when the features are ready, uh, such that we get a new churn score for each customer every day. Uh, this job also handles the calculation of the corresponding SHAP values for each feature. When the predictions are calculated, we store them in Elasticsearch together with the, the corresponding features and SHAP values. 
In our team, we use Elasticsearch to store most of our data, and we use Kibana as a visualization tool for this data. Kibana gives us a very nice overview of our churn data, and it makes it really easy to search through it and plot it in different ways. We can, for example, plot the distribution of churn probabilities for different customer segments, or like this uh, image shows, plot the distribution of shop values for a specific feature. Visualizations like these makes it way easier for us to understand how our churn model actually works. 30 days after the prediction is done, we are able to check whether it was correct or not. Uh, we have a job that updates our churn data with the, actually, the actual churn status as soon as we know the actual label. Having this information makes it easy to monitor uh, how well our model performs over time. We have created a dashboard in Kibana with different performance metrics, which makes it easy to see if something strange happens or if the, the performance decays over time. In the future, we should probably also implement some kind of alert that tells us when this happens, so we don't have to check the dashboard that often. This is a more detailed and complex presentation of our churn uh, prediction pipeline. We use both AVS, the blue background, and GCP, the yellow background, in our churn pipeline. The pink boxes are the Spark jobs, and the green boxes on the green background are the train and predict job. These jobs are all running in GCP. The Spark jobs produce features and when 30 days have passed, it labels the data as churn or not churn. These files are then used as input in the train and predict jobs. To the right, uh, you can see that the churn predictions generated from the predict job are stored in elastic search indexes in AVS. All the dotted lines between the boxes are events. So when one task is finished, it sends an event which the next task listens to. The only thing that isn't automated here is training a new model. We won't go into more detail about the architecture, but if you have any questions about it, just let us know. So this uh, churn pipeline have been running in production for a while now, uh, and we are currently working on how to actually use the predictions to impact the overall churn rate. Uh, when we first started on this project, uh, we only had a lot of data about our customers. And by developing a churn prediction model, uh, we gained a lot of insight. Uh, we learned what typically describes a customer likely to churn, and we learned what type of features had the greatest impact on churn. Uh, we also gained an overview of the happiness of our customer base, and we are now able to monitor that by looking at the churn score. Uh, all of this insight is valuable and it can be used to, uh, for example, try to get customers to use specific product features that we now know have an impact on churn. But our main goal is to use this to take concrete actions based on the predictions. Uh, we want to go from data to action, preferably in an automated process. Uh, and one thing that our analytics team is working on right now uh, is building a data-driven engine for personalized notifications or messages to our customers. Uh, and our plan uh, is to incorporate the churn predictions in this system. Uh, we want to be able to segment our customers based on the churn score, in addition to what specific behavior uh, those customers had that made them get that churn score. Uh, for example, we could try to remind uh, customers having a high churn risk because they stopped visiting our service, uh, that we still have a lot of relevant content for them to watch. Uh, and in that way, we will try to move the number of visiting days for those customers uh, in order to possibly move the actual churn probability as well. So that was the end of our story so far. Discussing the business needs was the first stage we went through. We are happy that we included the stakeholders as much as we did in this stage. And I'm sure it was valuable for them as well, especially when they start using the churn predictions in the future. 
A negative thing about this stage was that we didn't specify a concrete use, uh, use case from the start, which made it difficult to, for example, land on a fitting churn definition. Then we started on the model development stage. Uh, in this stage, we experimented a lot with different features and we got some valuable insight from this work. However, we spent too much time on meetings and discussions with the stakeholders and this kept us from starting on the deployment stage earlier. In the next machine learning project we do, we will probably focus more on the developing of the model and a little bit less on communicating and discuss, uh, discussing results in this stage. In the deployment stage, we collaborated with a data engineer. This helped us to speed up the development process and to create a solid system, which is easy to maintain. However, we used a lot of time dealing with Spark-related issues, just because we didn't really understand it that well. If we had used more time in the beginning of this stage to get more Spark knowledge, I think that this process would have been more smooth. And now it is actually uh, it's, uh, time to actually use our model and create some business value. As Silly said, our end goal is to go from data to action. And hopefully we can come back next year with some information on how the last stage went. So that's it. Thank you so much for listening. I really hope you learned a little bit from this presentation. And if you have any questions, just let us know.